Okay, hello everyone. Uh, so this first tutorial for today. Um, uh, so today's tutorial is going to be more or less, um, it's going to have a, a lot of overlap with what uh, you had, a tutorial you had yesterday about um, data science workflow. So basically, you can consider it some kind of a, an emphasis and or um, a chance for you to basically showcase that you understood uh, yesterday's information. So yesterday, in yesterday's uh, tutorial, you have uh, this, like, there was a discussion about CRISP, uh, right? So, um, can uh, like one of you maybe volunteer uh, to explain what CRISP is? Uh, remember. Anyone? Yes, al uh, Well, basically, from what, from what I understood, uh, CRISP is a data mining technique we can use whenever we are approaching any data science uh, related project. For example, the first task we'll do is to understand the business, meaning what we should do, what are we looking for in the questions like that. And then after that, the basically uh, it's more uh, after that it's more technical meaning uh, cleaning the data what how should we model it uh, i don't uh, exactly remember the middle steps but after uh, on uh, on the later part it speaks about uh, iterating all this process in order to uh, have a more clear result uh, that's great. Yes, um, that's basically it. It's a methodology, basically, you follow when you are uh, conducting data science projects, as machine learning projects, and like uh, all of these have like a lot of overlap, basically, data science or machine learning, data engineering, all of these things have a lot of overlap. They work on the same workflow. So, yeah, so this was a good answer. Uh, you will have uh, more like um, you said, like, yeah, I don't remember the steps, but once you start working on like this week projects and hopefully more projects, uh, you will understand, like you will, you understand all these steps because you'll have to do go through them repeatedly. So just like, um, so this is the flow that uh, like uh, we had to mention basically. So you have this, uh, like six steps, uh, more or less. It starts from business understanding, data understanding, data preparation, modeling, evaluation, and deployment. Uh, but uh, so these are steps, but like you go through them, not, it's an iterative process. So you go through them, not in like uh, in, um, necessarily uh, you start from one and end up with six just one time. You have to go back multiple times, uh, basically, to iterate over and improve uh, to, until you get the result you want. So I know that you went through this, but let's go through these steps again and try to maybe, um, I will be asking you basically, like, how this applies to the project you are working on this week. And we will try to answer together, like, how or just like to, to make sure that we understand how this applies to what uh, we're doing this week. So um, starting from the first step, which is the business understanding, like here you define the objective of your project. What are you trying? What are what goal are you trying to achieve? What uh, and how are you going to um, define it? How are you going to like evaluate it basically estimate that you have achieved your goal so can you can one of you venture 
like what is a business objective or like what is the objective of this business because like of course like uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a business we're not talking about a business this week but yes uh what is the business understanding what is the goal of this project for this week can like let's see if anyone had an answer for that like how can you define the the goal for this project for this week and give a couple of answers if it's possible you can also write of course and you cannot speak okay uh make pip and okay yeah. so i believe the purpose of the, this week is uh, to uh, to understand uh, our capabilities and uh, if we are capable enough to uh, progress through to the main program okay good it's a good answer can we have another like can someone else like uh, maybe you can agree with this one or like uh, do you have another different answer Um, yes, Alazar. Uh, I think the project's main aim is to check in the sentimental correlation between global news, uh, global news data, uh, any topic uh, correlation, or uh, what are, what the main topics are for all the uh, data and the, uh, global media data set. Okay, good. Okay, so um, good answer. Thank you. And so basically, this is like the like the two answers you can have. I accept the, also the first one because it is what is uh, uh, the like the stated goal of this week project. But yes, uh, the goal of the analysis also is to understand uh, the the the, uh, the correlation between. Um, uh the like uh, the frequency of reporting and sentiments between in news um data set or for news domains um okay we have another answer from Abu. this week channel focuses on sentiment topic reporting correlation among various global media agencies yes so basically whenever you start uh like a project you have to start with by defining a goal what are you trying to achieve in this um with this project uh so um like uh this is like we include like uh once you define the goal you can define like uh how you are going to go about about it uh how are you going to measure the progress you you towards the solution you, like the problem like you're trying to solve how are you going to measure if you have solved it like you have to define a metric let's say um and uh, like to, to measure this like if you succeeded or not um or like how much you have succeeded like and then you can plan also the uh, the tech stack you're going to be using during the the in the project as well so the next step will be the data understanding. Um, okay. Here you identify. So this is the this step where, like, basically you identify the source of the data. If like, um, like if you are getting the data. Um, so in this in the this project for for your case, you are not getting the data yourself. You get like we give you the data right uh, right away, but uh, in um, generally you might be like trying to source your data so you have to think about where to get the data or identify the possible data sources you can use um collect the relevant data and then like uh, format the data or like identify like what kind of formatting you have um and then you have the ada step basically the exploratory data analysis um trying to understand the data so okay so le let's uh, just let's, let's stop uh, at, at the ada part 
because I'm guessing that it is like uh, maybe new for um, some of you at least. So can you tell me like uh, in exploring the data and performing ADA, exploratory data analysis, what kind of things you can try to do? What like what kind of operations you can try or what kind of um, what can you do to do the data basically to, to perform ABA? Can like let's get some answers, like maybe five answers would be good. Um, so this is like a, so this is a task you are performing in task one, basically. So um, Okay, we have one answer, grouping and sorting the data. Okay, good. Getting the data size, another good answer. So Maya, if there is missed data, uh, um, the correlation between the data, I, I don't know the size is, this, uh, I don't know what this you mean. <laughs> Let's see, shape, I suppose. Shape of the data, the correlation between the data sets, yes. Good, good, good. Uh, we need more, two more things you can do. So, summary statistics, visualization, understand characteristics of the data. Good. Data cleaning and pre processing. Yeah, yes, okay. Data cleaning and pre processing, these are like generalized terms. Uh, I include a lot of stuff, but yes, correct. Outlier. So, yes, outlier analysis, seeing like if you're uh, handling finding outliers and handling out uh, outliers. Class imbalance, okay, this is a specific case uh, when you are doing classifications, but yes, this is another um, example of things that you can do in pre-processing or like in, in the ADA. Um, it, it will also fall in the data preparation step, which is the next one. So as like, uh, so very good answers. Um, you can continue to answer if you want, it's not, um, uh, so you can see in the, let me go here, um, you can see like you have that understanding and then in the next step is data preparation. So what we call ADA is like, like false between the two. So it's like some parts here, some part here as well, because there will be like, um, uh, things like handling missing data for example, or handling outliers, this will be like part of the data preparation in a sense because you are changing your data, your data itself, uh, changing the formatting, um, uh, adding more features to your data, so basically enriching the data or like deleting some of the features, all of these are like part of the data preparation. So you are preparing for machine modeling, machine, machine learning, um, like, um, using your data for machine and learning models. So you'll be do, doing the different step. All of these are called ADA, in like a general term. Uh, so yes, uh, let, let's say like you have um, summary statistics, basically looking at individual features in your data and um, looking at like uh, what is the mean, what is uh, like a standard deviation, if you have numerical data, or if you have categorical data, you can look at like how, what is the distribution of your of your of your data, what is the amount. Um, I know, like probably you know most of these terms, or maybe if you don't know, you have to learn. Anyway, this is what you do in summary statistics. Uh, like, and then you can also start visualizing your data. So again, if you want to look at the distribution of your data, so it will be better to look at like a graph actually to see how distributed, uh, how is your data distributed in visualization or like uh, even in, um, in statistics, you can also compare is like, this is the one variant, like when you're looking at one variable, you can also look at two variables and see how correlated they are. If there is a relationship between two, you can like plot a scattering plot between uh, between two variables to see how 
related they are, if they if there is some linear relationship between them or not, something like that. So all of these follow falls into the ABA. Um, again, as I said, this falls in in. Uh, I already answered the question. So basically, in your challenge, in your challenge for this week, you have ABA as your first task. That's one, right? Um, you have to perform ADA analysis and you are basically given like some particular things that you can uh, extract during your ADA, basically, things that you can note, uh, like what is a website with a large discount, so maybe I can share. Like I'm looking at the challenge document here. So this is uh, like task one, you have like performing ADA analysis, it's part, right? And then, like you are given, so these are you can look at for more stuff, of course. But like these are the things that you can take uh, guidance and look at these. I'm trying to answer these questions. So this is what ADA is. You are trying to understand your data. You try to extract information from the data, basically, um, and understanding the patterns, uh, and later on also preparing the data for. Uh, the next steps, basically. Um, okay. Uh, so basically, we covered data preparation here as well. This is also part of ADA cleaning, making sure that your data is, is consistent. For example, you have to handle missing data, right? And um, so. Like um, okay, so uh, let let's see if you you know how, how to handle missing data usually. Like, what do you do with missing data usually? Like um, okay, so defining missing data first is like when you have data, you have like um, let's say you have columns, uh, tables, and sometimes some of the values in your columns are missing for some of the for some of the entries have some missing values. So like information that you don't know, basically. So I'm asking, well, the question is, what are the different um, approaches to handling missing data? Like in details, what, what do you do? What are the options? And like, let's aim for a couple of answers. Um, imputations, yes, good. Uh, like, uh, can you give an example in particular, Abel? Like, what can you, um, how can you, like, uh, impute your data? Okay, yes, like filling with mean, median, or mod. Okay, that's very good. So, uh, imputing data is basic, meaning that you just, like, uh, you're going to fill the missing data with some value. And you choose the value depending on your on your use. So um, basically, you can, for example, this is very simple. If you have numerical data, let's say you collected your data set has like heights for um, in, in a sample of uh, like of people. You can fill uh, if you have some missing data for some heights for some people. You can just fill it with the mean with the average height. So just fill all the missing data with the average height. And like basically in this technique, you are not changing the average of the whole data. So when you fill with the average, you are not changing the average, of course. Uh, if you have categorical data, of course, like for example, um, the good categorical data, uh, let's say if you have um, um, income ranges, for example, like this is not numerical, it will be categorical, it will be the range, uh, different ranges. Then you can replace the missing data for some people. It's going to be if you have like some people who don't have the information about the income range they have, you can fill it with the mode, which is the most common value, right? So these are like uh, things you can do. If you have a, a time series data, like when you have, for example, um, Okay, we have another answer. 
removing missing data this is the simplest thing you can do if you have like and when you when you use that of course if you like the missing data is like let's say you have uh, in your data set you have uh, like a uh, hundred thousand rows and like uh, the missing data is only in in a hundred which is very like a so one in a thousand like it's a point one percent is missing you can just remove the rows that have missing data and just be done with it you're not worried about it but if you're missing data for example is like a, a large percentage you will have to to deal with it or if your data set is already small Maybe you don't want to remove the missing uh, the rows that have missing values, so instead you have to like, fill some of them. Um, okay. Oh, and so Mama's answer is very uh, comprehensive. Have imputation, and uh, you can also use like an advanced thing. It use uh, a machine learning model basically to predict in a way what should be the missing value. Very good. So uh, I think this is um, so. You have, I think you have a good understanding of this. Or for people who don't um, who don't have uh, like uh, don't know this, you can ask questions or like you can just um, research like uh, the terms you are hearing here. Anyway, that's um, so. This is uh, data uh, in data preparation. There are like um, depending on what kind of model you are trying to use in the next step which is modeling uh you will need to do different things to prepare your data for that step so it will be like um uh sometimes maybe you want to to add more features basically maybe you have already some features you can compute more from them or like uh, you can standardize or uniform basically like changing um uh, standard, standardizing is like uh, changing the values to transforming the values such that the distribution the values like range maybe from instead of like um, if your data uh let's say ranges from very uh, very large uh, numerical values um you can get to be from transform it such that it ranges only from zero to one or from minus one to one and uh, or you can change it or so that the distribution is a normal distribution with um with a mean equal to zero and standard, devi the standard, uh, standard deviation equal to one so this is what's the standard deviation of, and and changing the transforming the data in a way that is preparing it for the machine learning uh, model step next uh that's because like um of course also we might sometimes you have categorical data you can change it to numerical data such that like uh, the machine learning model can handle it so all of this will will fall in the data preparation uh, step um uh, the next uh, okay um okay so we all talked about all of this <laughs> Before. So in the modeling, um, so basically it, it can be like a machine learning model, can be a statistical method, depending on what you're trying to do, of course. Um, here, like um, um, in the modeling step, you have to choose your model or your models. Uh, you have to do things like uh, splitting the data into like depending on the case you can split the data into testing evaluating and um training data so divide it to train evaluate and testing data sets or maybe it's just training and testing i have to choose your like um the metric you will measure the performance of your model with so for a classification model you will use accuracy and like um the uh what else um the recall and um so you can use like a accuracy and recall metrics for a classification model for regression model you will use um um 
uh, square root um, error or like you depending on what is what you are trying to do you are the the, um, the metric you'll use is different so uh and usually you have multiple choices of metrics also you can do you have to build train the models depending again um uh and assess the model performance so there is, uh, if you can see here, there is like a, uh, um, an arrow going back, basically, to the data preparation between data preparation and data modeling. It's because like if you, depending on if changing the choice of your model, will change the how you prepare your data sometimes. So um, it's, not, it's not like a one way. You can go back basically in steps to, depending on what you do here, you can go back and try to prepare your data in a different way uh, as well. So, for example, feature uh, engineering or like trying to choose features for your model. Sometimes you don't have enough features or like you have to reduce the number of features. Like you can see that when you perform, like when you use your model and see the performance is not working very well, you have to go back and basically do some feature engineering so that you can you can like get a better model or get a better performance. Um, okay, so uh, this closely related to the evaluation step. So like uh, you have this is evaluation not only like um, of course you already chose like uh, your metrics. And you define your goal in the business understanding step. So you have to evaluate after modeling the modeling step if you have achieved, like, have you solved the problem or not? And uh, of course, if you manage to solve the problem, you're fine, you're done, it's okay. But uh, sometimes, like, uh, if it's not, it's still, you're still not uh, at. You, can, you, have, you might have to go through the whole cycle again, basically getting more data. Maybe sometimes you what you find is that you need more data, basically. So you have to go back and get more data and go through the whole thing again. Or like um, maybe like uh, there is something that was missing or like in the understanding. Sometimes you get from um, that maybe you discarded some features that uh, like turn out to be important that you have to go back like maybe you handle the data in a way like uh, like in in the evaluation data you find that when you handle your data in a particular way maybe you throw off your model so you have to go back and and redo some of these steps so uh, you might go through this cycle multiple times to 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 basically achieve like a um like a satisfying result um okay and once you get like a good result you go to the deployment step which here like you basically you like you push your model to uh, develop uh, a production environment basically so um this step that doesn't mean like you have you stop this is not the end usually like you monitor when you like push your model to production you monitor like uh, um you have to maintain it and you have to monitor its performance continuously and you might need to go through the cycle again if you like collect new data or like if you notice that the performance is not um it's not like it's not performing as you expect. You have to go through the whole thing again. So this is the whole cycle. Um, yeah, it didn't. Uh, okay, I went through a, a little bit maybe quickly. But um, so any questions? In particular, when it comes to the the this week challenge, maybe. Uh, the question I had is not exactly for this week's question, uh, for this week's uh, project, but uh, on the first step on business understanding, uh, do we need to have a domain knowledge in order to uh, incur, uh, tackle that uh, problem? Or 
uh, how do we how do we approach that? Uh, that's a good question, I think. Um, okay, sometimes uh, that's why, like, um, you don't usually define the, the goal necessarily yourself. Uh, and yes, uh, um, sometimes, yes, you need domain knowledge to understand, like, what is a goal or how you define the goal. So, um, here like uh, in this development cycle or this is sorry in this uh in this workflow um multiple people are included like uh in a team let's let's say a big team you will have data engineers you have data scientists you have uh, machine learning engineers and you will have like uh, other um um What is the world I'm searching for? Uh, other people might be involved in in defining what is the goal of the of the project. So yes, what? Um, but like uh, in in the sense when you are working on this yourself, or like let's say as a data scientist or like an engineer, you just have to understand like what is the goal when it comes when it comes to to your data, what you are trying to get. Uh, so the answer in short is that yes, sometimes you'll need some kind of domain knowledge to define what is a goal, uh, but um, so it's not like a, that's why like, a, I, as I said, like a lot of people are involved in, to, in, this, in this workflow. But when it comes to you, what concerns you is that like uh, you have to understand like once uh, um, so for example for like for this week uh, project for like uh, during the training when you get the projects you will always have the business goal defined so you have to make sure that you understand it and you understand how it applies basically to the data you have and how basically you 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 are going to go about to achieve it. Uh, through like different models or different like how you're going to employ your data and machine learning models or whatever models you're going to use um, to get there or also like defining the metrics or how you're going to assess it. So does that answer your question? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. Problem. Thank you for, for asking. Any other questions? Uh, yes, Mohammed. Uh, okay. Okay. So Mohammed is asking, what is feature engineering and why do we need it? Uh, okay. So feature engineering is like um, basically. Uh, let me just use uh, in basic terms. You are creating more features or reducing your features or combining the features you have into new ones. Uh, and um, you, why do you need it? You need it because uh, um, basically it's a step that sometimes you need or a lot of times you need when you are applying some kind of machine learning model to your data. And let's say, for example, um, if you want to create um, uh, a regression model, so you're trying to predict something, um, let's say, how to say, let's say I'm trying to predict, uh, um, I'm trying to use an example to just uh, hopefully that I will make it easier. Let's say I'm trying to predict what is the market value or like uh, of, of, um, of a house. And you have a lot of data, a lot of data from like uh, many houses, basically. And you will have like things like the geographical location, the the like different the number of rooms, the number of bathrooms, and then like uh, maybe information about the income of people like in living in the area, uh, the number of people who live there, like the number, the year of construction. You can have a lot, lots of, lots of features in your data. Maybe let's say like you have like a hundred 
um, columns in your data set in your table and you want to use um, a, a linear regression model but if you are using uh, um, if you have a lot of features the, the model is not going to be like um, let's say as um, there is like a there has to be a relationship between the number of features and the number of data set uh, the number of rows you have in your data set basically to make the model meaningful that it has some kind of prediction so what i'm trying to say like okay let me <laughs> rephrase this um so if you have as i said if you have a hundred columns or hundred features in your table and you are trying to define a linear regression model that means you'll have like a hundred or a hundred plus one um, var um, variables or weights that you're trying to calculate in this uh, the model the machine learning model is going to try to predict the weights for for all of these hundred variables because like you have to give each feature a weight uh, to that measures basically its contribution to the final to your target variable so if uh, um, this is not going to be very like uh, if your data set is not very big and you have a lot of features that means a lot of weights that you want trying to, to compute and then um, it's not going to be very predictive basically this model so to make it more uh, to basically make it more uh, to improve its performance you will not instead of um, having all of these features considering all these features what you can do is basically from your data in your ada step you can see which uh, uh, features correlate the most with your target variable basically doing some pca what is principal component analysis basically like you are the you are determining which variables correlate the most with your target some variables are like are not going to be affecting your target in any way so you basically are going to re get rid of them reduce the number of uh, features you have in your data set not necessarily and you can basically combine them also like combine a multi a couple of variables into one um in a way and uh, like doing some kind of projection um what else yeah so this is one thing that we can basically do so reducing the number of features you have and basically making your model more predictive um does that make sense to you i know maybe i said a lot of things that I didn't completely understand but like does this make sense to you muhammad Okay, good. Um, yeah, so, um, okay, moving forward, uh, I wanted to discuss MLOPs as well. And, um, okay, just to define what MLOPs is, like machine learning operations. So maybe you have this in, you have like, uh, you know what DevOps are, right? Let's just give a get an. Can you define what DevOps are? Yes. Uh, who raised their hand? Uh, is it Abel who, who wants to answer? I missed you. So, okay. Um, anyone? I'm asking about DevOps. Maybe you had defined yesterday. Um, 
Yes, Alaza. Uh, DevOps is basically combining the two processes, uh, uh, making them uh, streamlined, uh, meaning uh, basically they receive all the files from the development team and they optimize it so that the deployment phase doesn't uh, cause any troubles. And if there's any troubles, they troubleshoot it. And basically, they're the bridge between development and the deployment. Okay, yes, yes. Um, yeah, that's a good answer. So, um, so I'm talking about Dev uh, MLOps and they are like, uh, it's DevOps when applied to machine learning uh, projects, basically. So DevOps, uh, in, in essence, these are like the, the, it's a set of practices and tools that you use uh, in uh, in development, basically, when you are trying to automate and integrate processes between software development and and production, basically. So, um, the like the concepts are going to be shared also with MLOps. It's just what do, what we are including here is machine learning models as well. So. Um, as you can see, like here is the def definition here. Like it's like it's practices, principles, and tools you use when you are like uh, making it smooth between deployment, monitoring, and managing machine learning models in production environments. So uh, you start with like um, uh, like for example, start with version control. You have uh, in, in DevOps, you have basically code version control, and you use Git for that, for example. When you are using GitHub, you are like, whenever you are changing your code, you are committing the change, right? And uh, you can basically, when you commit things, uh, means that you can go back, like uh, you can like uh, say, so did some change, made some commits, and I did some more changes to my code, and did another commit, I can go back to my, uh, like the previous commit, uh, I can go to the version. So I have like, um, I'm keeping track of my, the versions of my code, right, in this, in this way. In when machine learning models, you can keep track also of your data and uh, data code already from DevOps and also the model specification, basically. Because in machine learning models, you have hyperparameters, right? You can define. You know, these are just parameters you have to change. You can change when you are defining your the model you are using. You can, there are knobs you can turn basically and to change uh, like the performance of your model. So there are different parameters depending on the machine learning model you are using. And um, let's say, for example, if you are doing clustering, uh, you can change the number of clusters, right? So you want to cluster your, your data into two clusters, three or four, and then you do this uh, unsupervised trading and get uh, the number, like the cluster your, your model. Hyperparameter in this case is the number of clusters. So you can change this knob, changing the number of clusters you're using. So this will change the, the model specification. And basically, you can keep track of this. So, if you are like experimenting with your machine learning model, changing these parameters will change the performance, right? So, you want to keep track of what you did. I tried these uh, values for hyperparameters, and then I tried new values for hyperparameters. And you want to keep track of that. So, you basically can have project control for that. Another thing, uh, so you have. Uh, Tools like ML flow, weight and biases, or Comet ML. These are tools you can use, like similar to Git. To Git, you can for code. You can use this for to keep track of your model specifications. Uh, another thing you can keep track of is the data. So when you're doing, uh, as we said before, in the ADA, you can do like you can do things like clean your data and then like uh, handle missing data you can handle the outliers 
uh, you can also change like um, features and any any new change for the data and instead of like um, you can also keep track of that using tool like DVC uh, data version control basically. So this is like in addition to code, you can keep track of this stuff. Um, another thing in, so let me just go through because we don't have a lot of time. Um, we have automation. Okay, so you can automate steps from data ingestion, pre-processing, model training, and validation, like defining what is called sometimes pipelines and define a pipeline that define what you do. You get the data, like the pre-processing, like uh, including like handling missing data or, or any kind of transformation you apply. You can basically uh, automate all of these steps so they can, you don't need to, to do it manually, just you have to like automatically you can, uh, you can use, um, uh, uh, a scheduling or a scheduling tool to do all of these steps like automatically once you define them and um, you have like continuous integration and continuous delivery CI CD um, this is what you is what you already have for like in DevOps but in in the machine learning model um, for MLOX you have also continuous training and continuous monitoring for the for the model after after deploying it and continuously train it continuous monitoring with like new data um uh okay and like um model governance this is like uh when in the, like this includes documentation, clearing the clear documentation for everything, for all steps, so that it's like um, easier to to maintain uh, and to collaborate with other people and to to for um, it also like maintaining the data quality as well. So okay, so these are the general uh, principles and like. Perhaps the benefit is that it makes it uh, better, like more efficient, it's easier to maintain and um, easier to improve as well. Um, yeah, that's it. So any questions regarding MLOPs? I know I went through very quickly, but... Um, Uh, and maybe while you are, are thinking, um, we have any, any questions, like, um, I can show you like some of the, yes, this is a list of uh, tools you can use in MLOPS, basically, for example, there is long chain, you will, you will come across these tools, um, I, I mean, hopefully when you join the training, uh, you will come across these tools in different projects, or if you like uh, go on your own. Uh, Langchain is particularly one that handles uh, language models. Things like uh, you know, GPT uh, in the one that is using ChatGPT, um, but this one is not open source. But the other models, language models, like similar to one like Llama, and um, what else? Other uh, open models for um, language models. So basically Langchain is very useful, uh, particularly for language models. And they have uh, like, um, it, you can build pipelines, so it, it's easier to automate the whole training and deployment thing. Uh, there is also a platform for like testing and, and deployment, Langchain, Langser. For example, this is just one tool. Um, there's Llama Index, which does seem, seem something similar to Langchain. They also have testing. Um, this is like the model, what we talked about, the version control or experiment tracking, right? 
so you're keeping track of your experiments in, in mainly like the specification of the machine learning model. And um, so you have ML flow, this one, cho one choice, um, uh, comet ML, and there is a uh, um, weight and biases as well. So in this, okay, question. Uh, yes, uh, my question was, uh, I've heard of, uh, I have never used it, but I've heard of uh, Docker and Kubernetes. Is Are they used in ML, machine learning? Uh, okay, um, yes. So you can use it in machine learning projects. Uh, you can dockerize your code, like uh, the code you have um, uh, for training your model, you can basically dockerize that, that the code you have, basically. So it, they can be used as well in these cases. Um, and I, like, I, I don't know if you, yeah, so there is a mention here, I think in the challenge document, I think of Docker. Um, maybe you have it as one of the tasks. Um, it's an optional, but yeah, if you like understanding what how Docker works and like how can you decorize um, the code you have, yeah. But uh, like well, for example, what's the difference between this uh, using Docker and uh, and uh, for example, the uh, Llama chain or ML flows that you mentioned? Mentioned. Okay, so um, so okay, good good question. So Docker, you can dockerize the code. So it's like part of DevOps, like dockerizing the code, meaning that um, you can have uh, your application. Um, so um, in Docker, wh what you do is that basically you, in just basic terms, is that you put all your code you can put your code in a Docker image or like multiple images. And this image, like anyone can take the image and create what is called the Docker container. A Docker container is like, is similar in a sense, like the same, it's not exactly the same, but it's like in a, and since it's similar to a virtual machine, it's not correct, it's a virtual machine, but it's similar to that. Basically, like it runs, uh, let's say a Docker container can be like you can define it to be, for example, an Ubuntu system, and, um, and then you add like uh, whatever like uh, your um, your application code. You can add it to that in the image, and then like anyone who has Docker basically can create this container, even if they are using Windows or whatever. It will be like an Ubuntu container and it will run the code inside it. So, yeah, this is what Docker is. It's basically you are putting your uh, your application in, in a, yeah, in a container, <laughs> in a container that like you are isolating. It's, uh, it will be isolated from the operating system that is uh, the person is using on their host machine. Uh, it will be separated the libraries that are in like uh, that are installed they will be sub separated isolated so later on during the training or maybe in your life you can use a lot um docker containers to run uh, different applications just because you don't want to actually install what they require in your local machine you just want to install them into the Container will be run separately from everything else. So this is what is what Docker does, or what is a Docker container is. Why do you need like long chain, or for example, you can have also hugging phase is deploying the actual model. So in a Docker container, you can run the training of your model, or um, uh, in a sense, you can also have like uh, if you um it's a specialized like it's just going to be a specialized because you can include your actual model as well basically into in this like um, in this container as well 
we, with other code, we can include the training of the model and the, one, the person who runs it will run the training and get um, uh, can run the training on their own data, for example, and then um, get a particular the resulting model. Or um, in uh, what is specific, this is specialized long chain, or for example, hugging phase, you can basically deploy the model alone. So if you train the model, let's, let's say a language model, like Llama, for example, uh, Llama is a very big language model. And um, this bigger language models is made from like many uh, neural network layers, right? Many uh, what I call the transformer model, which is like made, oh, essentially it's just neural network layers with different specifications. And the training of the model defines like a lot um, the weights in this model. So they will have um, a lot of parameters that are going to be defined or computed during the training. And basically, a person can run, like use the model right away, in the same way that where when you are using chat GPT, you are just running the model, you are not training it, you are just using it. So basically, you can load the parameters, the weights, all of them into like a hugging phase or in long uh, serve, you can deploy the model itself. Not the code used to train it, um just the model itself the weights that define it so in a sense this is a specialized way also because docker is not really desi designed to like um to handle data to just like you're not including the data with it usually and uh, you don't you don't use it to just download a specific uh, model so just uh, let's say it's, uh, it, you can use it for doing that, but like it's not it's not usually how it is used. I don't know if you have answered the question in a way. Does that make sense? I like so I said a lot of stuff. But... Uh, I think uh, my view of Langchain was wrong at first when I asked the question. I thought it was related to. Uh, uh similarly to quantization but i think uh once you explained it i think it's uh, very different yeah okay the concept is uh, kind of similar but yes uh, it's like uh, you're deploying just the model itself to be that can be directly used there basically it doesn't include the code doesn't include the training it includes the data or just giving a person the possibility to use your model right away so in land service uh, it's like an api in something like um uh as i was mentioning hugging face there is a, usually like the model and the model weights a person can just download the model and use it or like uh, on on hugging face they also have options to actually use the model right away on the on their website at least for some models so hopefully this will be clearer uh um, like in upcoming uh, like during the training again hopefully you'll join the training and then you you will get to use all of this uh, in different instances okay and there was another question we can take another question uh before like uh, Okay. So because we're uh, like over time, we can end the tutorial here.